If you've got your Bibles, I already mentioned we're going to 1 Samuel. We're in the middle of our Listen series. If that's new to you, you can stop by the Welcome Center. They'll get you all caught up through the, the app, the technology, the devotions, all of that. We're studying it on Wednesday nights in our table groups. But we're continuing this journey, this chronological journey through the Bible. And we're seeing how it fits together as one big story of God's goodness and his faithfulness. Now today we're revisiting one of the best known Bible stories of all time. You will finish this sentence for me. David and people who don't even go to church know the end of that sentence, know the end of that phrase. Because even people not raised in church have an understanding of what the idea or that concept of David versus Goliath. And what's funny is everyone's always David in the story. No one's ever Goliath. We're always David's. It's always the underdog versus the champion. And the structure of this story, the idea of the underdog, has been used in countless books, countless movies and stories. But I think God might have something just a little bit different for us today. But in case this is new to you, in case you don't understand the biblical context, give me just a minute. We're going to set this up. The Israelite army is faced off against the Philistine army. And the problem was that no one wanted to fight the Philistine warrior, the Philistine champion, right? They were afraid of defeat. They were honestly afraid they were gonna die. And I thought about having somebody come up here to give you the illustration today. We'll talk about it in a minute. But we, we think that Goliath was over nine feet tall. And I was going to try to give you an illustration because I'm 6'2", and so what I need is like a three-foot person. And I doubted we had a three-foot person in the room. I thought about bringing a kid up from, from kids' church. But just to give you an idea that this isn't something just to gloss over, this was a, this was, this was a big deal. And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to read for a couple of minutes here, verses 1 through 11. We'll skip around just a little bit, but just to give you the, the context of what's going on. It says, the Philistines now mustered their army for battle. And Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops. That's King Saul of Israel. So the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. And he was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet that had to be heavy. And his bronze coat of mail or armor weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor. And he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. Are you getting a picture for how big this guy is? Think of the tallest person in the NBA that you can think of, and this guy's at least two feet taller than that. That's pretty tall. It says his armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. So there's two guys coming out to fight. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called, which is funny because nobody was. They were all sitting in their tents hiding. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Now, if you remember last week's message, we talked about for the first time that Israel wanted a king just like everybody else. So before the last story, they were the children of God. Now they're no longer associated with God. Now they're associated with their king. But you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. Verse 11, when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. So the Israelites are trembling in fear. They're too scared to fight. And then as we jump into the story, the runt of the litter, right, the little brother that everybody had overlooked, little David, shows up to bring his older brothers some food. That's why he came. His father sent him to, to check on the brothers and take him some food. So David shows up and the Bible tells us that he can't believe what he's seeing. This little guy shows up and he says, what do you mean nobody's fighting? Let's read on in verse 32 of chapter 17. Here's what David says. 
He says, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Imagine the ridiculousness of that statement. This is a boy. He's not even a man yet. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. <laughs> At that point, Saul's probably thinking, are you trying to talk me in this or out of this? <laughs> when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. If I'm sitting there and I'm Saul, I'm pretty sure he's making all this up. There's no way this can be true. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Verse 37, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And whatever happens in Saul's mind, he finally says, okay. Now imagine, he just put the entire slavery of the nation on the shoulders of this young boy. Because that's what the deal was. That's the only way that Goliath was going to come out and fight. He says, all right, go ahead. And may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a... <laughs> oh, I just, I'm, I'm picturing this in my head. A bronze helmet and a coat of mail or armor. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. You ever put on like your father's clothes or your mom's clothes when you were a kid? That's what this was like. Everything was too big. There was no way you could function in these. He says, I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. Verse 40, he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Now let's stop right here for a minute. Let me ask you a question. How much do we have to be protected before we're willing to step out in faith and obedience to the voice of God? How much protection do you need? How much protection do I need? How certain do I have to be of the odds that this is probably going to work out in my favor and that nothing really bad's going to happen before I take that step of faith and obey what I feel like the Lord is telling me? David had nothing in the eyes of everybody else. And yet, the Bible tells us, you'll see in a minute, he ran toward Goliath. He had no armor. He had no armor bearer. He had no sword. He had no spear. He had no javelin. He had no shield. He had no physical person to protect him. But listen, David had all the protection he needed because he was walking in simple faith and complete obedience. When you're doing what God has told you to do, you can be confident even if everybody else is making fun of you. If you make a decision that's not popular with anybody, but you're convinced in your heart that God has spoken it, then you step out in faith and obedience and God says he will be your protection, right? Psalms tells us that he goes before us and he's behind us and he's beside us and he's all around us when we're walking in the will of God. So he had the benefit of God's favor because he was following after God's heart. In church, when our hearts desire, have you asked yourself that question lately? What do I want? What do I want with my life? What's my desire? Susan and I went furniture shopping yesterday, trying to figure out stuff in the new house. And she made a statement <laughs> that I'm probably gonna totally mess this up. She says, well, neither of us are gonna get what we want. So we're gonna find some compromise in the middle. Now, how many you know when mom is happy, everybody's happy, right? No, but we got something that we both like. Now, in a perfect world, she might have chosen something else or I might have chosen something else, but we found something that we could, that we could live with. But what does your heart want? What's your heart's desire? Can I tell you what I want mine to be? what I want mine to be. Because when my heart's desire is simply to be pleasing to the Lord, when my heart's desire is to simply follow after his heart, then his favor and his power rests upon me. When your true heart's desire is just to be pleasing to God, 
no matter what anybody else says. Doesn't mean you always get it perfect. None of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. But when your heart's desire is to follow after God and you step out in obedience, the Bible says that his favor, his blessing, his power rests upon us. And we see the result of that starting at verse 41 in the same chapter. It says, Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. By the way, if you've never seen the VeggieTales version of this, I highly recommend it to you. Verse 43, says, am I a dog? He roared at David. We don't know how tall David was, but five foot, five foot something maybe. He's a boy. The Bible never gives us any idea about David's height. It does about Saul. It tells us how tall Saul is and he was head and shoulders above everybody else, but it never says anything about David. So He's not an adult yet, so we're going to assume that average height is a teenager, so maybe five foot something. He says, am I a dog? He roared at David that you came at me with a stick. And he cursed David by the names of his gods, meaning Goliath's gods. And he says, come over here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. You ever felt like you had that Goliath in your life? Like someone who just would rejoice at your demise, right? Who would get excited at your failure? Who would throw a party because you fell? And it's at this moment in our lives for all of us that we have a decision to make. And it's really that simple. Are we gonna cower in fear when the enemy does his best to silence us? Are we gonna cower in fear and retreat when he lies to us? when he prophesies, notice my air quotes, prophesies our defeat, when he predicts our destruction, or are we gonna press on in the power of the Holy Spirit? Because our confidence doesn't come from what we see. Our confidence comes from what we know to be true. And sometimes you just have to confess your faith even when you're not even sure you believe what you're saying. You gotta begin to speak the truth of the word even when you're struggling. Remember the guy in the New Testament? I believe, but help my unbelief. So he spoke in faith and yet confessed that he was struggling. That's okay. Jesus can work with that. Jesus can work with that. So look at David's response starting at verse 45. It says, David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin. In other words, in your own strength. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Now notice this, because I think this is the part of what God wanted us, us to see today. Notice that David never took it personal. David never made this a personal attack. When he speaks back to Goliath, he names what the actual problem is. He said, it's the God of the armies of Israel that you have defied. Right? This isn't about me. This is about him. David knew this was about something far bigger than himself. David knew that this, as we talked about a few weeks ago, was about the glory of God. And sometimes I think we in America, and I'm sure there's other places that do it too, we get sidetracked because we make everything personal. Somebody says something about you and you take it personal instead of realizing they've just got an issue. They've got something that's going on. And like Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't really know what they're doing. But we tend to make everything personal. But can I remind you that it's not always about us. Sometimes it's about God and his glory. And we don't need to take these things. We need to just keep our eyes on Jesus. We need to keep our life centered on him. And David understood this, even as a young boy. And so in verse 46 and 47, here's what he says. He never makes it personal. He knows what this is. He says, today the Lord will conquer you. And then he does add a little phrase here. He's like, and I will kill you and cut off your head. So there was a little bit of a jab in there. (laughs) And he goes on. He says, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. Remember, nine something, five foot something. You got to picture this. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know. And this is where he brings it back in. He says that there is a God in Israel. 
And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle. Sometimes you need to remind yourself of that. This isn't your battle. This is the Lord's battle. Can you say that with me? This is the Lord's battle. Remind yourself when things get hard. You're not the one that does the fighting. The Lord does the fighting for us. And he will give you to us. So this is throwing down the gauntlet, right? This is the moment. Little David is trash talking a nine foot tall giant, right? David's got game at this point. But David knew it wasn't about his strength or his ability. He says the Lord, Yahweh is that word there. Whenever you see Lord in capital letters, capital L-O-R-D, it's Yahweh. He says the Lord, Yahweh will conquer you. This is the Lord's battle. I can't always think that it's all about me. My life isn't about me. My life is about bringing glory to God. David understood this. Verse 48 It says, as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. I I love that picture. Quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. Now, I've always wondered about that. Like, you got helmet and you got all this stuff on. How do you leave, like, your your head exposed? I just don't even know how that works. But somehow, hits him in the forehead says the stone sank in think about that for a minute this wasn't like a glancing blow this was like boom and it sank in and stuck in his head the stone sank in and Goliath tumbled and fell face down on the ground verse 50 so David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone for he had no sword and then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath and David used it to kill him and cut off his head And the Philistines saw that their champion was dead. They turned and ran. Can I just remind you of something today? The enemy is a coward. He talks a big talk, but he's a coward. The Bible says he knows he's already defeated. He's a trash talker with the best of them, but he has no game. No game whatsoever. And the moment that we rise up in the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit, our enemy has no choice but to retreat. And I want to double back to this idea of obedience because notice, to the best of my knowledge, this scenario never happens again in Scripture. There's never a face-off with a giant and a sling. And sometimes we see something in Scripture like this and we take it as doctrine and we say, well, that's the way we have to do it. Well, yeah, if God tells you to do it that way. So listen to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about your specific situation. It doesn't matter what grandma did. It doesn't matter what mom and dad did. It doesn't matter what the pastor did or anybody else did. What matters is how is the Holy Spirit telling you to approach the situation, the the journey that you're going through? What is it that you're supposed to do? There's some things we get from Scripture we know. Standing in faith, we get. But be very careful that you don't just adopt what somebody else has done. Do what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Say, Pastor, what are you trying to say today? Well, what I know is that in one day, God changed the, tra- the trajectory of David's life. In one day, it all changed. But no, if you know the scripture, God had already proclaimed David as king privately. Remember that? Where Samuel goes and he's told to anoint the next king and he goes through all the brothers and they finally call David from the backside of the desert tend and sheep. So God has already anointed, he's already proclaimed David as king privately. The prophet knew and his family knew. I guarantee you the, prof- the brothers didn't tell anybody. So at best, a very limited circle of people knew what had happened. And you know what happened after that? Nothing. David had to sit and wait. Because sometimes God speaks something far in advance of him doing something. And I had to learn that in my life. I hear God speak and then I begin to act on it. God's like, I didn't tell you it was time yet. I was just giving you a heads up so you could prepare yourself. Sometimes God speaks something long in advance of him actually doing something. But now in this moment, God changes the trajectory of David's life because God thrusts David on the national stage. David was not planning on fighting the giant that day. He didn't get out of bed and said, I'm going to go join the army. We're going to go settle this battle today. He got up and did what God told him to do that day. And all of a sudden, David is thrust on the national stage very, very dramatically. Everyone in Israel within days 
would have known now who David was. What did it take? It took an act of faith. It took an act of obedience when no one else believed in him. If you read the whole story, his brothers mocked him. He shows up. And they're like, what are you doing here, little? Go home. You don't even belong here. David's life changed course almost overnight. Or did it? Actually, what I believe is that David was already on his course. He was already being obedient to what God was telling him. And God chose that moment for everyone else to see what had already been prophesied over David's life. Hear me, you can't create your own moment. You gotta wait for the moment the Holy Spirit brings and the Holy Spirit reveals. You gotta trust God's timing. And so here's what I see in the life of of David in, in this story. That applies to us today. When we're concerned about God's glory and we're concerned about the people in our community, we'll dare to do things differently. This is what I think God has for us today. Again, we tend to make the David and Goliath story a a very, very individual one. But for David, he wasn't concerned about himself. He was concerned about the glory of God. He was concerned about the fact that if Goliath won, the rest of Israel would be you know, thrust into slavery. And because he cared about God being defended, God getting the glory, and he cared about the people of Israel, he dared to do something different. He dared to take a risk. He dared to get out of his comfort zone. In church, when we allow the Holy Spirit to get us outside of our boxes, you know, conventional wisdom in that story said to fight with all your armor on. But David chose to go only in the power and the protection of the Holy Spirit. David went with just a slingshot and the favor of God. And it's easy to say now, but how many of you prefer the favor and the slingshot over the armor and no favor? Right? You prefer the favor of God, right? We, we want God to, to be there with us. So David's passion to see God lifted high in Israel caused him to take a big risk. His brothers made fun of him. Saul didn't understand him, but it didn't deter him. He moved forward in what God had spoken. His people... <laughs> In his heart, he knew when he, what he saw that day. His people needed hope. His people needed deliverance. And I won't belabor this point. I've already mentioned it. But I just think in, in America, we have a tendency to over-individualize everything. And the story of David and Goliath is not, first and foremost, a story about standing up to the individual Goliath in your life. That's not really what this story is about. We've preached it that way a million times. I've probably done it. But it's really not about a one-on-one scenario. This is about taking on the giant for the good of everyone else. It's a story about putting everything on the line for those around you who will suffer the consequences if you don't. What is it that God is asking you to step out in faith and do that seems overwhelming? That's for the benefit of those that are around you. See, David's willingness to obey was the first step, but it was actually in walking it out that the real difference was made. See, David brought hope to his community because he was willing to to put his life on the line for their good, right? The shouting, the insults, and the confessions uh, from one side of the river did nothing, but taking that huge step of faith and running toward the battle, even when no one else understood it, literally on this day changed the course of, of an entire nation. It wasn't about David and Goliath. It was about the entire nation of Israel. I just wanna say this to you today. I desperately want my life to make a difference in my community, to bring hope to this generation for the glory of God. I know it was in vogue several years ago to write your own personal mission statement. If that's something you've done, then God bless you. Um, It's not something I ever really settled on for myself because I think our personal mission statement is to what Jesus told us in Matthew 28, 19, is to go and make disciples, right? That's our mission. But if I were ever to write something that would come even close to a personal mission statement for me, it would be this, that I desperately want my life to make a difference in my community to bring hope to, to this generation for the glory of God. Church, I don't, I don't wanna play church, I wanna be the church. Right? I don't wanna come to church on Sunday and scratch an itch and hope I preach a message that makes most of you happy so you come back next Sunday and continue to give in the offering. 
Right, that, that's, not my, that's not my mission. I, I, I wanna be the church to people. I wanna bring people to the hope of Jesus, to people that are stumbling along in the darkness without a real relationship with their heavenly father. That's what I wanna do with my life. And I hope that's what you wanna do with your life. I hope it's burning within you like we talked about last week to, to, to bring people to the heart of the father, to give them hope that there's something better than what it is that they're going through. And you know, many of you, you know, we've been praying for quite some time about changing the name of our, of our church. And, you know, we've fasted, we've prayed. Many of you have joined us on that journey. We, we've sought the voice of the Holy Spirit. We've sought counsel from our district leaders. Uh, we've talked to our members. We, we've, you know, prayed through everything, considered all the ramifications. But, you know, at the end of, my, at the, end of, of the day for me, here, here's what it comes down to. What's burning in my heart, what dominates my thoughts is to be a place of hope for those who don't yet know Jesus. That's what I want to be. That's what I believe God wants this place to be. And God has given us so many confirmations of this over the, over the past year. And, you know, everywhere I turn, <clears throat> how many of you just wish I'd just get to it? No, I'm kidding. Everywhere I turn, God is using people and places to speak to my heart. And the word that I keep hearing is the word hope. And many months ago, there was a private word given to me right down here that God was going to make us a house of hope. It's been repeated to me several times since then by many, many different people. And we've been praying about the name. We've been praying about timing, all those things. And just a handful of months ago, we had missionaries here. I don't need to tell you who it was, but... I didn't know them well. I'd met them at a, at a conference. I liked them. I liked what they were doing. And so we invited them in, but uh, I, I had never met them before that. And so they were driving up to minister that day. And when he came inside, he said, hey, I, I, I've got something for you. I got a word for you, however he said it. And I said, okay. And he said, when I was driving up Main Street this morning, he said, the moment I saw your sign, and he knew nothing. He said, the moment I saw your sign, God told me to tell you it's time to change the name. Don't be afraid. Do it now. And I've had two or three of those from different folks over the last several months, just confirmations of, of God's word coming, telling us that there's, there's a new season that we're about to step into. There's a new season as a church that we're about to step into. And I want you to hear me clearly. We will always honor our past. When we were founded in 1966, this church was first assembly of God, all good. Many of you may not know that. And for the first 10 or so years of our existence, that, that was our name. And then in the 70s, when there was a lot of theological things going on in, in Pentecostal circles, uh, the name of our church was changed to Trinity. So people would know that we believed in the Trinitarian doctrine. And that, that spoke to believers so they would know what our doctrine was all about. And that name has been good to us for, for 40 years. But beginning today, after a unanimous vote by our board and overwhelming support from the vast majority of our church members, for anyone in this community who is struggling to find hope in this broken world, and for anyone who was willing to listen to the gospel message, from this day forward, we're going to be known simply as Hope Church. I recognize it's not the most unique name in the world. We weren't trying to be cool. We weren't trying to be hip. Is hip a word you even say today? I'm old, I don't know. We were trying to capture the heart of the Father for this house. And we exist to give people hope. We're moving forward. We're linking arms. We're focusing on the harvest by dedicating our lives to giving them the hope of Jesus. Now, it's going to take time to switch everything over, so just be patient. I kind of have a little bet going on with the staff about who's going to mess up and say Trinity first. I'm probably going to be the one to lose. Some things you'll see change right away. Other things are going to take time. We understand that. But, but this is a big day in the history of our church as we begin to make a transformation. And I want to reiterate that this was not about anything being wrong 
This was about God calling us into something new. It's a day where we're refocusing on what God is calling us to do in this season. We continue to believe, in case you're wondering, and this will make sense to those of you who have been here a long time, we continue to believe that we will be a lasting work until Jesus returns. As we continue to love people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And I simply say this, this is our message to the community. For all the hopeless, the hurting, and the hungry. Who's heard that before? For all the hopeless, the hurting, and the hungry that are everywhere around us, we say simply, welcome home to hope. There is hope for you. There is hope for you in Jesus. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. And we're about hope. Team, why not you guys come on? I've asked Pastor Shelton. We're going to pray. And then we're going to sing. And some of these graphics will morph and change over time. I had a version that Kelsey disapproved of, and she helped me with this. So if you like it, this is all Kelsey. She helped me make it better. Yes, Kelsey. (laughs) She knows I'm messing with her, but she really did help me make this better. Things will change over time. We'll, we'll, We'll get all this done. But... For as long as God allows me the privilege of being part of this house, and I hope it's a long time, we're gonna bring people hope. I saw something this week. I saw a pastor online who was making fun of somebody who was homosexual. And it grieved me because the church needs to realize that if we don't give them hope, who's going to? If we're not going to make a difference. Who else is going to do it? So we're going to pray. And if I'd have had my way, Miss Janie Brown, our oldest longtime member, she was here when the church doors opened the very first Sunday. She's struggling with her health right now, and so she's not able to make it out like she was. But if I'd have had my way, and I talked to Miss Janie, and she's excited about this, I'd have had her come up and pray over us today. But we're gonna pray, and then we're gonna sing a song that I told you a few months ago that God had dropped in my heart. There's probably gonna be our theme song for a while. And I laughed because I walked off stage and somebody said to me, well, who, even who has ears to hear, let them hear. I said, yeah, because the Holy Spirit's beginning to speak this word hope to us. And I'll tell you what, if you read your Bible, it's everywhere. Hope's everywhere. Now, there's a video going out today, 1130, just a few minutes. For folks who weren't here today, I uh, talk a little more deeply about it. I encourage you to watch it so that you have answers when people ask. Um, and it'll probably be at least 20 years will be the church formerly known as Trinity. We understand that. It's fine. But we know inside these walls, our mission is to bring hope to the hopeless. Would you join me in prayer? Father, God, a name change is one thing. A heart change is something else. God, we don't want to just change a name and have a fancy new graphic and and, and look modern. God, we want our hearts. We want our hearts to be focused on the hopeless, the hurting, and the hungry. We want our lives, our mission to be wrapped around bringing hope to those that are far from Jesus, who need a hope because, God, they're floundering. They're barely keeping their heads above water and we with the power of Jesus can be the difference not in the world but in our neighborhoods in our communities and those people that are right around us God let us start right here at home and let us bring people hope God we we set apart this day We mark this day, not because anything was wrong, but because you're calling us to something new. We are a people of hope, and we will give hope to those that we meet. Because fathers, we're about to sing. This isn't about us, this is about you, and you are the one who keeps hope alive. So Father, we pray this simply. We ask you to bless it, 
We ask for your favor and your anointing on this house that we would be a house of hope. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.